really enjoy, call it local history, call it regional history. Uh, it's fun even if you're not from that region or locality. And, and I'm not talking about local county histories. You see those all the time. Go to Barnes and Noble and they'll be selling the history of Coriel County or the history of Dallam County or whatever. But this is local or regional history in a narrative form. Nonfiction, not fiction, but nonfiction. Uh, generally, to be of any real interest to anybody, uh, this kind of history has to uh, uh, show you something that's really fun or eccentric about that region or locality or dovetail with some sort of national significance. I'll give you, I'll give you an example of, of one that was a big hit a number of years ago, and that was Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Uh, that is a local history of Savannah, Georgia. It's narrative, it's nonfiction, it brings out all the eccentricities of all the people involved and makes the region really fun to explore. So much so, I, when I was taking a, a bus group tour of Savannah a number of years ago, uh, we were in the Bonaventure Cemetery, one of the most beautiful cemeteries in America. I, I had already read that the little bird girl statuette that's on the front of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil was in that cemetery but had been removed to the museum. I was walking by myself letting the group just look around. At least four people came up and said, where is Bird Girl? And I was able to say, it's in the museum. Uh, but that's the power of that kind of nonfiction. They had read the book, they had seen the cover, and they came to Bonaventure just to see the Bird Girl sculpture. So uh, Midnight is a good example of really successful, best-selling local or regional nonfiction. It really does need to be a narrative. It really does need to tell a story. And it really does need to be either nationally significant or so much fun, so much eccentricity that you just can't put it down. Uh, now recently, uh, recently being uh, maybe three years ago, a uh, book came out called The Kings of Big Springs. And I knew that was about Big Spring, Texas, and, and uh, uh, went over to uh, Half Price Books where, they, where the author was speaking. And there were like 40 people from Big Spring, and we had a great discussion. I'm not from Big Spring, but I really enjoyed it. That's an example and, uh, of local history that was also of national significance and was also a, a, a fairly big seller. Uh, now today we're going to have three of those, and that's, uh, and that's what's going to make this fun. Uh, the Deepest South of All, True Stories from Natchez, Mississippi, followed by The Vapors, A Southern Family, The New York Mob, and The Rise and Fall of Hot Springs, America's Forgotten, capital of vice and the last sheriff in texas uh, that one came out about three years ago the other two came out this year the last sheriff in texas a true tale of violence and the vote uh, takes place in the area of beeville and bee county and so uh, each one of them is a real page turner generally pretty sharp and i wanted to review them so that uh, you might get a flavor for each one of them you might want to order and read one or more of those so let's start with the deepest south of all. And, and uh, what I want to do is talk about the garden clubs. That's what he talks about, the garden clubs of Natchez. Now, I have toured Natchez. I've taken group tours to Natchez. I think I've, I've gone on the pilgrimage tour for the last 50 years, every few years. Uh, Natchez is an interesting little town, about 15,000 people. The last time I took a group there, uh, I noticed a lot of... Uh, for sale signs, even on some of the big mansions. Uh, so I, I, my perception was there was a fair amount of economic distress in the area. Uh, Natchez is, uh, last I knew, dropping in population. But oh, the big, beautiful mansions in Natchez. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, Howler Nuts big uh, octagonal mansion. Stanton Hall, the biggest house in the South. Natchez uh, was not destroyed during the Civil War, and that's why it's the biggest group of antebellum mansions in America. And back in the 30s, uh, they decided they would capitalize on that. They formed the Pilgrimage Garden Club. Uh, later, there is, a, and still is, a Natchez Garden Club. Pilgrimage is still bigger. Uh, but uh, Natchez, uh, as this book goes to great pains to tell us, is in many ways run by women because the ladies of the garden clubs and the, and the tour, which is the big tourist event in Natchez, uh, uh, dominate the town, along with the pageant. It's, it's, a, it's a, uh, 
the tableau. Uh, if you've never been to that, it's really interesting. I, I've never seen so many young men and women running around in Confederate outfits, uh, you know, celebrating the history of Natchez, and, and some of it became sort of politically incorrect over the years and has been edited some. Uh, but kiddos, kiddos with the financing of their families are kings and queens of the court. It's a very old Southern tradition of Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, so uh, being the eater that I am, I love to go to Stanton Hall, or the carriage house. The old South food that's next door in the carriage house is lovely. Uh, but it's a great old town. It's a small old town and very insular. I was staying there one time in a place and was talking with the husband of the wife who owns it. He married into the family. He was from the north. Uh, husband basically told me, you know, I've been here for 35 years and I'm still an outsider. <laughs> you know, it's a small town with a vengeance, uh, but with a real tradition. And, and it's the, it's the, uh, it's the uh, eccentricities that the author Richard Grant, who's a, a Brit, uh, brings to it. He was considering moving there. He ultimately didn't for reasons we'll mention in a minute. Uh, but uh, he analyzed all the people, all kinds of interesting folks. I'm going to read uh, a, a general description he gives of Natchez. Uh, it, it, all starts, it all starts when he comes to do a book signing at the King's Tavern, which is a restaurant there. I parked outside King's Tavern, a two-story building of brick and timber, uh, still recognizable through its restorations as an 18th century tavern. Pushing open a stout wooden door, I came into a low ceiling room, heavy beams, exposed brick walls, bar made out of whiskey barrel stays. Regina Charbonneau hugged me like an old friend, uh, the, the lady from the garden club, from the pilgrimage club. She led me up a steep, narrow staircase to the room where I would sign and sell books. I set out my wares, greeted my customers. They were far more sophisticated than I was expecting in a small, isolated Mississippi town. I talked with an extremely well-read woman who had lived all over the world before coming back to Natchez, where she grew up. The way of life here, she had decided, suited her best. Asked to describe it, she said, we're house crazy. We adore old homes, antiques, throwing parties, making it fabulous. Gay men love it here. Natchez is very liberal and tolerant in some ways, and very conservative and racist in other ways. Though I'll say that our racists aren't generally hateful or mean. Uh, nor do they think they're racists. There's still a lot of denial in the white community about the fact that this whole town was built on slavery. Most black people don't like thinking about slavery either, although they're acutely aware of it. She talked about the insularity of the town and the singularity of its culture. We look more to New Orleans than the rest of Mississippi. The Catholic influence is strong in both the black and white communities. We're obsessed with our history, but it's often self-serving mythological version of that history. Genealogy is big, and there's a whole spectrum of behavior that we refer to politely as eccentricity. I wondered aloud if Natchez might be an interesting place to write about. She made me swear to keep her out of it and warned me against bird watching. A lot of outsiders come down here like bird watchers, studying the inhabitants, observing their quirks and colorful plumage. Well, guess what? The birds are looking right back at you, and sooner or later, one of them is going to talk ugly about you. Well, he did write the book, and he did mention her a whole lot, along with Sir Boxley, a, an, an older African-American man who's kind of a, the civil rights advocate in Natchez, or was. Um, it, it is an interesting old town. I love Natchez, Mississippi, uh, but uh, she's right. The birds look back, and uh, ultimately, I'll go ahead and uh, spill the beans now. He would have lived there, except the school district wasn't good enough in his estimation and people were way too gossipy. They knew too much about each other's business. It's a small town. Where is that any different in any small town? But, but that's Natchez, and, and, and the, the, the pilgrimage pageant and, and the tableau and, and, and all the old homes and all that goes on at Stanton Hall, it really makes Natchez fun on the spring pilgrimage tours. But uh, there, one thing about this book that's really interesting, it's interwoven every other chapter uh, is about a very famous Natchez area resident named Ibrahimi the Prince. Uh, and so you're doing modern Natchez with all its interesting uh, ups and downs, and, and then you're doing Natchez of the turn of the 18th century, uh, which was when Ibrahimi the Prince, who was a Guinea prince, uh, was in fact uh, picked up by a slave trader, brought over, 
served decades in the fields in Natchez, uh, ran away, came back, uh, but ultimately came to the attention of national authorities, President Adams, Henry Clay, and was brought, uh, was brought to Washington and was sent back to his, back to Africa, not his own country, unfortunately. He was sent back to Liberia as a member of the, uh, uh, the, the folks who went back under the, under the American Colonization Society, which took American blacks and sent them to Liberia. That's why the Liberian culture through the 50s was dominated by the descendants of ex-American slaves. He never made it back to Guinea. He died in Liberia. But that story is interspersed with modern and Ibrahimi, modern and Ibrahimi, which makes it really an, an, interesting, an interesting story. The, uh, the uh, fact about Natchez that, that uh, was so interesting in this is, is a DNA fact that I just found fascinating. I'm going to read that. Um, uh, one, of, one of the things that goes on in a, in a town that, uh, that is an antebellum town um, is, is the, the intermixture of races. The advent of cheap, accurate, mass market DNA testing has confirmed a difficult truth about African Americans. They are overwhelmingly the product of miscegenation, uh, nearly all of which was beyond their ancestors' control. Virtually no African Americans today can claim pure African descent except for recent African immigrants. The five leading DNA com companies have slightly varying figures, but taken together, they indicate that the average African American is about 75% Sub-Saharan African, 22% European, and 1 or 2% Native American. By tracing paternal ancestry through Y-DNA, geneticists have found that a third of African American men today are directly descended from a white male ancestor who fathered a mulatto child in the slavery era. Now, I can't say that I have scientifically investigated this author's claims, but if that's true, that's really an interesting finding. And, and of course, that is the heritage of Natchez. Natchez, in the 1850s, uh, was the richest place in America, up and down the river, all the way to Baton Rouge, all the great plantations on the, on the plantation road. Um, uh, were in, uh, 1858 was probably the height of it, and of course the war came in 1860, but, but uh, um, the whole area is fascinating. It's not mentioned in the book, but uh, nearby is Vicksburg, uh, about just a few miles uh, up the road is Vicksburg. Uh, in between is a little town called Port Gibson, Mississippi. I love it. The little gold finger on the church that points to heaven. Uh, Grant did not burn uh, Port Gibson either. He called it the prettiest town, the prettiest old town in the area. And, and uh, uh, nearby, down by the river where Alcorn uh, University is, uh, just a few miles down a farm to market type road, are the ruins of Windsor Plantation. It's used a lot in movies. Uh, 21 great Gothic columns, metal columns that stand. I go there in the mornings and in the evenings. And, and the, the Gothic columns are what remains of, of America's greatest plantation home. Made it through the war, burned in 1890. It's called Windsor. You can watch movies like Rain Tree County and see Windsor. Uh, so anyway, fascinating area. But, but um, let me do another couple readings, particularly one about the eccentrics of, of uh, Natchez. As I say, the thing that made Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil uh, in Savannah so interesting, and what makes this book so interesting, are the local folks. So let me read uh, from, from uh, one passage. Among the upper crust, there's a definite pride in Natchez's reputation for eccentricity, and people often became defensive when it was suggested that other places in the South might be equally eccentric. Maybe Savannah? Uh, Brent Brenniger, the head of the annual Natchez Literary and Cinema Celebration, had tried living in Savannah, Georgia, another town renowned for eccentrics. It was way too normal uh, for me. I couldn't handle it. On a weekday at uh, Elodie's house over cocktails, I met Wayne Bryant, a middle-aged gay man steeped in Natchez lore and garden club history. He enjoys visiting Savannah, but when I asked him if it was as weird as Natchez, he was insulted by the question. Not in a million years, he huffed. When the garden club elite gathered at cocktail parties in each other's antebellum homes, the basic unit of social interaction, they would tell one outlandish story after another and invariably start conjuring up the extravagant characters of the past. 
such as Catherine Miller, the founder of the Pilgrimage Garden Club. Uh, the most extravagant character of all was probably Buzz Harper. He died shortly before I got to Natchez, but he, talked about, but he was talked about so often his presence lingered. He drove a Rolls Royce, often wore a full-length mink coat, spats a huge diamond stick pin. He was six feet four. Uh, he ate raw steak, close friend of Anne Rice, the best-selling author of vampire novels. Um, I'll stop there. Really, the, the descriptions of all these people are so interesting, and I'm sure many people in Natchez would say overblown, maybe not, uh, but, but Natchez turns out to be a very interesting society of its own. Um, now, I tell you, in my own personal tours, I was, uh, I, I looked into some of those signs I saw in the mansions, and the costs were equivalent to a, a, a nice home in Highland Park, not the best home, but nice home. So it is, it is kind of uh, tempting to think, what if I lived in Natchez? But it is a different culture, and, and it is, uh, well, one thing, one thing I could say about it is, uh, summed up by one of its, uh, one of its uh, uh, young, younger members, Carrie Dix. I'm going to read again. During one of our wine drinking sessions in the cemetery, she liked to go to the cemetery, Carrie Dix made, a, made this observation. The trouble with Natchez is that the dead won't die properly and let us get on with our lives. They just keep hanging around. They demand a seat at the table. They can't bear to be ignored. So we have to talk about them all the time. The worst thing is that they won't stop judging you. I don't believe in ghosts at all, but I can feel it physically when my dead ancestors are embarrassed by my behavior. Natchez, she thought, was being consumed by its past. We resurrected our history in order to sell tickets and make money from it, but it's more powerful than we are. It's like we resurrected a monster and now we can't control it. Sometimes it feels like progress is impossible because the dead are running the show. So uh, perhaps overblown, perhaps not. You can talk to Natchez residents and see what they think of this book. But uh, The Deepest South of All, True Stories from Natchez, Mississippi by Richard Grant is really a fun read, particularly uh, if you've spent a lot of time going to the, the historical tours and seeing all the great homes in Natchez. Uh, it's, it's only six or seven hours away, and so it's an, not that hard to drive. So, uh, so we've done the deepest south of all. That's a regional history. Another regional history uh, that's, that's out this year by David Hill, a, uh, who grew up in, in Hot Springs, it's called The Vapors. It's about the, it's about the history of Hot Springs, particularly right after the war through the 50s into the mid-60s when, when gambling came to an end, essentially, in hot springs. Uh, the subtitle tells you everything. The New York mob, the rise and fall of hot springs, America's forgotten capital of vice. So let me read you, let me read you from this book. He has some interesting, um, um, he, he has some interesting uh, descriptions of hot springs. In fact, I am headed there Saturday, so uh, I'm going to go up and down Central Avenue and relive some of this stuff. The uh, uh, and, and some of you have probably been there too. Uh, years ago, I went to stay at the Arlington, the, the, the big hotel with the baths, you know, Bathhouse Row in, in downtown Hot Springs. Uh, I didn't know when I was bathing there that others before me, namely Frank Costello, uh, Al Capone, uh, many others, uh, lots of sports stars had, had uh, always come for the baths. And, and so uh, Hot Springs uh, uh, also ha had and has uh, a, a uh, horse track. It's called Oak Lawn. Uh, my dad was a private pilot. We would fly there in the early 60s and uh, he would gamble. I guess I was probably too young. I feel like I was gambling, but, uh, but we would gamble on the horses at Hot Springs uh, at, at Oak Lawn Racetrack. It's still there. The, the, race, the races take place in the spring. Uh, but little did I know that it was a town that was often frequented by Frank Costello, Meyer Lansky, uh, Al Capone. Um, it, it, interesting history. Let me read. Let me read a description he gives of Hot Springs. It, the center of it's a national park. Has been since the early 20s because of, because of the Hot Springs. 
The hot water brought visitors in search of the medicinal qualities it was said to possess. They came to soak in scalding hot baths or to sit in so-called vapor cabinets. A lot of you have probably done that. I've done that too. Often on doctor's orders to treat everything from diabetes to epilepsy. Prize fighters like Jack Dempsey trained for fights in hot springs in order to be close to the baths. Baseball players like Bay Ruth would spend the spring months in hot springs recuperating by soaking in the hot water. The popularity among professional ball players was so great that hot springs eventually became the official spring training location for a number of major and minor league teams, Brooklyn Dodgers, Boston Red Sox, Pittsburgh Pirates. As visitors to hot springs would disembark from their trains, they'd be besieged by doctors advertising their services, such as post-bath mercury rubbings. <laughs> It's a mercury rubbing, that's what you want. Uh, some of the more popular ailments uh, that patients came to treat were venereal diseases. Al Capone would take the waters in the 1920s to treat his syphilis. These regular and quasi-permanent guests built hot springs into one of America's first resort towns, one that aimed to rival the glitziest spas of pre-war Europe. Hot springs grew into one of the most unusual cities in the country with an economy that re revolved around tourism and employed some of the South's most colorful characters. From carnival folks to musicians and artists, people of all races and religions flocked to hot springs for work taking care of the diverse and often international guests. Despite being deep in the heavily Baptist and segregated South, hot springs boasted two synagogues, a Jewish hospital, two Catholic churches, a Catholic school, 19 black churches that served the city's thousands of African-American residents, most of whom worked in the bathhouses or the hospitality industry. On the east side of Malvern Avenue were black-owned hotels, restaurants, theaters, even a black-owned and operated hospital. All this in addition to a growing number of Greek, Italian, and other European immigrant families, all of whom followed paths to hot springs to either take the baths or take care of those who did. And taking care of the bathers meant more than just scrubbing them and drying them off. The hospitality business in hot springs was Full service. All the visitor desired was available. They needed only cross the street. You can read between those lines. Uh, on the other side of Central Avenue, directly across from the federally owned Bathhouse Row, were saloons, brothels, crooked auction houses, all sorts of bookmaker shops and casinos. The diverse residents of Hot Springs weren't a bunch of Bible Belt simps. Hot Springs was home to car dealers and bookies, jazz musicians, burlesque dancers, prostitutes, con artists, everything in between. Throughout the years, musicians from Duke Ellington to Elvis Presley would visit to perform or simply to vacation. Often these notable visitors to Hot Springs rubbed elbows with some of America's most notorious, as the small southern town's lax attitude toward crime and vice made it a popular hideout for criminals like Sam Giancana, Vito Genovese, Al Capone, and Alvin Creepy Carpus. Hot Springs was visited by sitting presidents and presidents-to-be and even saw one of its native sons, Bill Clinton, go to live in the White House. So that's, that's an interesting description of Hot Springs. Uh, probably one of the most fascinating parts of this book is, is how gambling and liquor thrived in Hot Springs when Arkansas was dry and gambling was illegal. <laughs> you can put that two and two together and understand that there were uh, amounts paid, there was influence, um, uh, influence was exerted, uh, and politicians worked alongside of people who ran casinos and various other businesses that were illegal, <coughs> including the, uh, the liquor by the glass that was sold all over uh, the major places in, in Hot Springs. Uh, some of Arkansas's and the South's major politicians had to kind of play along with a lot of this. Governor Faubus, Orville Faubus, came from the came from a country family in Arkansas, but uh, he learned to he loved to gamble at Hot Springs at uh, Oak Lawn, a racetrack, and and uh, and he was the governor. You remember Orville Faubus from segregationist days, which were these days in the fifties. But Orville Faubus, uh, Senator McClellan. Uh, Senator McClellan um, and Senator Kefauver, uh, you remember you remember Estes Kefauver ran with Harry Truman uh, in, in Truman's, uh, I guess it was maybe his first or his second run, I forget, 
but Estes Kefauver was the vice presidential candidate. A senator from Tennessee, uh, Estes Kefauver and John McClellan both headed Senate committees that investigated crime and, cr and criminal corruption in America. Both of them rarely got around to anything in Hot Springs, even though uh, they, they studied criminals every place else. In fact, criminals were a little bit upset about the, the kid gloves that Hot Springs got. You know, this was the era in which, uh, of course, Havana was a big gambling area. Meyer Lansky saw to that. Uh, Las Vegas was being built up in the 50s, and, and, uh, and Hot Springs was probably the third of that trifecta. Uh, and Hot Springs really didn't quite get the the investigations that the others got because some of these southern senators kind of worked to work to uh, uh, keep Hot Springs out of the spotlight. Um, now this story is told uh, by an author who grew up in Hot Springs. His grandmother Hazel was a shell at the casinos, and uh, there's a lot of family story in here. And uh, they tell the story of Dane Hill, who was who. Uh, was a, a, a young relation who basically uh, became the, the owner of the Vapors and basically became the big runner of casinos and those sorts of places in Hot Springs in the, in the later 50s into the early 60s. Uh, so there's a family story here. Uh, this is exactly what makes regional local history um, interesting to a national audience because you can use names like Frank Ostella and Al Capone and Babe Ruth uh, you, you, there, there's a national connection, not only eccentricities and, and colorful folks, uh, but a national connection. And so uh, now, uh, this, this period in the history of, of Hot Springs ended uh, about 1964. Um, and, and what ended it in some cases was the, uh, uh, was the Kennedy administration. Uh, uh, Robert Kennedy uh, was the Attorney General, and he went after organized crime, as you remember, in the early 60s. Uh, his emphasis on, on organized crime was such that Senator McClellan and Senator Kefauver could no longer sort of slide on hot springs. Uh, the federal government passed laws about inter interstate uh, transportation, not only of gambling devices, uh, but uh, interstate transportation of people involved in the gambling industries. So you could arrest people for, for going from place to place to work casinos. Uh, and, and, and that, the, the way they got around that in Hot Springs was Dane Hill basically uh, began training his own people. He, they didn't let them go from city to city anymore. He trained them right there in Hot Springs. The way he got around the gambling devices was they got all the parts and they built them uh, there in Arkansas, so they weren't crossing lines with gambling devices. Uh, but none of that, none of that ultimately pre prevailed. The, the heat got to be too much, and all the all the uh, uh, backslapping that went on between politicians and casino owners uh, ultimately came to an end. Now, this story is not only about those folks I've mentioned, but there's a character in this uh, that bears looking at the the gangster Oni Madden. Oni Madden. Um, uh, had quite a history as a gangster, but he had come to Hot Springs uh, in middle age, and he retired and died in Hot Springs, but he was, he was a center of Hot Springs uh, criminal activity because he knew Al Capone, and he knew Frank Costello. He was a friend of Frank Costello's, and so he, he, was, he was less uh, well-known and less active than some of the others in Chicago and New York and Tampa and New Orleans, but, uh, but he was a major gangland f figure that, that basically made, uh, made uh, Hot Springs his own. Uh, now, um, The Vapors was built by Dane Hill in the early 60s, and what they were trying to do was be less gangster-like, less casino-like. It was a casino, uh, but you started to do like Las Vegas often did. You had shows, you had nice eating venues. Uh, when the Vapors opened and, and within the few years it operated, you know, Frankie Lane, Mickey Rooney, Peggy Lee, the McGuire sisters, you know, uh, just a whole bunch of big names that, that you would know. Uh, performed at the Vapors. Uh, uh, Mitzi Gaynor came and did her show at the Vapors instead of in Las Vegas. Uh, 
Uh, and so they were trying to clean it up, make a nice place where, where politicians and mobsters and regular folks could enjoy a good meal, gamble a little, have liquor by the glass, and do all those sorts of things, and not seem just so uh, outside the law. And so uh, that was the attempt. But as I say, the Kennedy administration and all its initiatives, it all came to an end finally. And that's one of the reasons that, um, that uh, Hot Springs uh, is still a fun little mountain town with the hot springs and all that sort of thing. Uh, but it, it's no longer the capital of so many things it was the capital of before in a very interesting period. I, I'm sorry I was so young when I was going to Hot Springs. I would have been more uh, open to seeing what was going on. All, all I remember is we went to the horse races, we went to the bathhouses. Uh, this was in the late 50s and the early 60s. But it was quite an interesting town. Now, after how many years? From 1964, when gambling finally was not only officially against the law, but was actually uh, uh, kept from happening in Hot Springs until 2018, uh, gambling was gone. 2018, uh, the, the uh, racetrack out at Oak Lawn, uh, Arkansas passed legislation that allowed a, uh, a casino at the horse race track. And I'm going to be there this weekend just to see what it looks like. Uh, but, but the fact is, Hot Springs is still a fun town, but its history is just amazing. Uh, this is typical of the kind of local history that gets national attention because it has national connections, uh, eccentric characters, uh, really good narrative. Uh, and so I recommend The Vapors. It, it just came out this year, and it has been uh, uh, noted in, in many of the national uh, book reviews. So that's The Vapors. And, and what I want to finish off with is... is uh, is uh, this one. The Last Sheriff in Texas, a true tale of violence in the vote, takes place in, uh, in Beeville, in Bee County. If you remember where, where Beeville is, kind of think of the area where uh, Kennedy and Carnes and Goliad and George West, and it's kind of that area south of, uh, south of San Antonio on the road to... Uh, Corpus Christi, um, and nearby is Alice. And so this is the story of, uh, of uh, two people, really, uh, in a period of time. It's, it's after the Second World War uh, through uh, the election of 1952. So a seven or eight year period is involved in the last sheriff in Texas. Uh, true tale of violence in the vote. Violence. Uh, is they're talking about the sheriff who was so important in this area in that era, so well known, so feared, uh, uh, Vale Ennis. Uh, vale was the Bee County Sheriff. Uh, this, this book starts with uh, Vale has two prisoners and uh, they were, they're able to get a gun. He stopped at a gas station. They shoot him five times and he turns around and shoots and kills both of them uh, and then is taken to the hospital in critical condition but makes it. Uh, and he was one tough customer, uh, uh, Sheriff Vale Ellis of Bee County. Uh, and it's the story of Vale Ellis and of Johnny Barnhart, uh, who was a lawyer. He had been at the UT, a cheerleader, uh, came, came back and, uh, after the war and, and was basically a young lawyer in Beeville. Like a lot of young lawyers, he just put out his shingle, uh, represented some kind of difficult cases, and... Uh, a couple of them are real colorful. I won't get into those there in the book. Uh, but uh, but uh, got a reputation for representing underdogs. And uh, underdogs, people didn't like all that well, but they did admire him for doing the dirty work that was put in his lap. Uh, and so he, he became a young lawyer, um, had a lot of connections in town, got married, living a respectful life, and then he ran for the legislature. And then I think he only had one term, but in the state legislature representing that area, a vote came up. Uh, th this is also the story, uh, basically, of the era of, of, uh, of the Cold War and communist uh, opposing communist infiltration. A vote came up in the state legislature, and they basically said, um, it said basically uh, that all communists in Texas would have to register register 
uh, with the Secretary of State. Now, he didn't think that was constitutional. Uh, the vote was everybody for the legislation, he abstained. And people hardly would talk to him in Beeville after that for a long time. It was, it was kind of tough. Uh, he became the, the sort of the symbol of the outsider, but he continued to, to practice law. And, and uh, uh, Vail Ellis continued to be sheriff term after term after term. Vail Ennis, I meant to say. Uh, term after term after term. I want to read a little bit about uh, uh, Vail Ennis. First noting that, that uh, probably one of the most controversial things he ever did uh, was killing the Rodriguez uh, family males. Uh, he was sent out uh, to, to uh, pick up a child. There was a domestic dispute, uh, a divorce-related domestic dispute. Uh, he got out there, and uh, nobody ever knows for sure. Somebody claimed one of the Rodriguez's maybe drew a weapon on him, but the fact is, he, with five shots, he shot and killed all three of the Rodriguez's, and there was some question about that. There was some question about uh, his methods, they were the old-time Texas sheriff's methods, uh, the kind of things that are now uh, kind of given a, a, a black eye in, in modern uh, literature to the Texas Rangers, a lot of things that happened with uh, Hispanic folks. Um, you, you know the, the blowback on the Rangers for so much of that, including Doug Swanson's new book. Uh, but uh, Vail Ennis ran on that same kind of proposition although it was kind of equal opportunity. He, uh, I'm going to read a couple examples of, of what made him one tough Texas sheriff of his era. Let me read uh, this first one. This is what happened. This is what happened uh, if, if Vail Ennis said you needed to go to jail. There were two other killings that year, a shooting in a bar south of town and knifing on the west side, both resulting from arguments in bars. Each time the killer had the good sense to call the sheriff and turn himself in. You didn't want Vail Ennis coming after you. Um, what better proof of Mac, uh, Mac Monroe Steele was somebody that, that uh, uh, Johnny Barnhart, an uh, uh, insane guy that Barnhart had represented and got him off. Uh, on insanity. What better proof of Mac Monroe Steele's insanity than the fact that he didn't call Vail right away to turn himself in. In this town, offenders went peaceably. On his nightly round of the west side bars, the sheriff didn't need to run the troublemakers in. He'd simply tell them to go to jail and wait there. We'd be driving past the jail after midnight. There'd be all these men sitting on the steps outside, said Charles Quinn recalled. Uh, Vail didn't lock them up. He'd just, he'd just pick up drunks, take them there, tell them to sit there and wait until they came back. Sometimes he wouldn't even pick them up. He'd just tell them to go to the jail and wait, and they waited. Sometimes he would keep them there all night, then he'd send them home to their families. Uh, uh, he, he had a certain kind of old-time law enforcement style uh, that, that did great on the Hispanic population in town, and, and a lot of others who were dedicated to more civil rights like uh, Johnny Barnard. Uh, let me read another uh, section. This is with an Anglo guy. Um, gives you an idea of Vail Ennis. Um, this, is, this is a testimony of, of, uh, uh, of a local uh, named uh, Wendell Baker, I think. Mac Uzel was with me. After the show, we decided to go down to that one cafe that stayed open, the, the one next to the newsstand. We went in there and sat down at the counter and ordered hamburgers. Ada Faye Cuff, who was in our class, was a waitress in there. She'd quit school. She was real tall and people used to tease her. There were two men in suits and a lady. I guess they'd been saying things to Ada Faye. Ada Faye was crying. All of a sudden, Vail in is pulled up in front of the Manhattan, hit the brake on that old Hudson. He came in and looked around. Everybody just kind of got quiet. And I said, there's fixing to be something bad happen here. He walked over to Ada Faye and talked to her. She pointed to the people at that table. I think they'd been to the country club or something. Well, he goes over there. Vail wasn't really that imposing a figure. He wasn't that big. He said to the biggest of the men, you're under arrest for disturbing the peace. You come with me now. That old boy, he was well over 250 pounds, said, I'm not going with, and he almost got the word anywhere out before the handcuffs, handcuffs hit him in the face. When he stood up, Vail reached back and got those handcuffs and just bam, 
They'll hit him four or five times. Teeth were flying. He pushed him uh, against the wall. Are you sure you're not going with me? Uh, when he walked him outside, the old boy took a swing at him. Vale knocked him against the window, broke his nose, knocked the rest of his teeth out. Those handcuffs were quite a weapon. He opened the passenger door. That old Hudson kicked him, put him inside, and drove him off. About that time, our hamburger showed up, and I said, I don't believe I want this. And Max said, I don't want mine either. So we went home by the most direct route. Well, that is old-time sheriff from, from Vale Ennis. Uh, Let's see if I have any other descriptions of Vail. Um, I think that's probably uh, enough said. Uh, term after term after term, Vail Ennis was elected as the sheriff of uh, B County, and uh, about half the people thought he was uh, a mean, violent man. About half the people thought he was a great lawman and a savior of law and order in the town. And so, now, as I mentioned when we began, one of the important things that makes a regional or local history uh, interesting to readers is often a, a, some kind of national connection. And this book has that with, with the election uh, of the senators, for the, one of the senators from Texas in 1948. That was a race between Governor Coke Stevenson and young Congressman Lyndon Johnson. And that particular race, um, was out of a million votes cast, was just going a hundreds this way for Coke Stevenson, hundreds this way for Lyndon, just going back and forth. But it finally ended up being um, uh, in Coke Stevenson's favor until uh, they opened the famous uh, they 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 uh, opened the famous box from from Alice, Texas, uh, that had uh, 203 votes in it. Um, that that precinct in Alice was supervised by what was in South Texas was called the Parr machine. George Parr, later Archer Parr, uh, you know, the Parrs, the, the George was the Duke of Duval, and uh, basically he, he reigned in, in that area of South Texas. Um, so his machine supervised the ballots in Alice. Uh, that, those 203 votes gave Lyndon Johnson a margin of 162 votes in the Texas senatorial election out of 988,154 votes counted uh, and gave Texas the symbol of rigged elections for generations to come. George Parr had done it again. This surprised no one, but people were amazed that he had done it so clumsily. The fraud was so obvious that even Parr couldn't get away with it. Immediately, Coke Stevenson went to Alice to look at the voters list. The extra 203 voters for Johnson had been added in roughly alphabetical order in the same handwriting in blue ink. Uh, that's a real tip-off. The first 841 voters, those reported at the close of the polls, were in black ink. The county Democratic Committee took one look and decided to void the entire box. That would give the election to Coke Stevens. They'd meet on Saturday, so Coke's nomination would be clarified by Monday when the convention opened in Fort Worth. That didn't happen either. From Saturday morning till Monday evening, Coke Stevenson's lawyers tried to get the Texas courts to open Box 13 and look inside, while Lyndon Johnson's lawyers found one way, an injunction from an Austin judge to keep uh, the Jim Wells committee from hearing, from meeting, after another long, long readings by the two longest-winded lawyers in Texas to delay opening that box until it was too late. Compared with the clarity of that simple blackboard in Beeville, the virtual blackboard at the Fort Worth Convention was a cryptogram. For three hours, lawyers talked, 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 kept talking in the sweltering, smoke-filled ballroom, arguing why Box 13 should be opened, why it should not. At 9.48, the executive committee began voting on whether to accept Box 13. I are rejected. Nay. At 1 in the morning, the vote stood 28 to 28. The whole atmosphere was tension, recalled Democratic Chairman Robert Calvert presiding. Clint Small was still appealing for Stevenson to no avail. As the crowd laughed Small out of the ballroom, the last members of the executive committee, last member, one Charlie C. Gibson, came back from the men's room. The crowd stilled. Gibson made a moment of it. With no small dramatic flair, he said, I. And Lyndon Johnson's political career was validated. There was 
absolute uproar, louder than ever, with much kissing now. There were plenty of female Democrats on the scene to go with the smoking and drinking. Landslide Linden, 29 to 28. Uh, that, that happened in this region in 1948 in the senatorial election. The climax, and that's of national significance, the climax to this whole book <coughs> is between uh, Vail Ennis and, and Johnny Barnard. Vail's running for sheriff again. They put forward a man named Duffy to run against him. Johnny Barnhart starts uh, campaigning on behalf of Duffy and putting out publications and basically saying, uh, in so many words, uh, all the flyers are listed in the book, uh, do you want a man that's this violent? Is, is this the right way to have justice in Bee County? And you know what? Duffy actually beat Vail Ennis in the 1952 election. Uh, that's, that's why uh, this author called it the last sheriff in Texas. He was really talking about the last, uh, the, the last kind of sheriffing of that kind in Texas um, was his point. And uh, let, me, let me read uh, the kind of elegy he gives here at the end of the book um, to that kind of sheriffing and to that world uh, uh, in, in, the, in the early 1950s. Uh, the time of this election, the 1952 election for sheriff in Bee County. This was the crossover time when the remote regions of old cattle culture at last gave way to urban realities, when the most obscure ranchers got electricity and indoor plumbing, when U.S. Navy pilots began to land jets on the Shawnee Trail, and Texas ceded the last of the Old West images to the virtual world of movies and television. Within a few more years along the road between Beeville and Oakville, the homesteads of the 19th century cattlemen would be weekend resorts for urban doctors and dentists and accountants, the brushland replaced by fields of mown grass pretty as golf courses. It was only right that the changeover be formalized here, in this small triangle of the world with its mesquite and wasachi and powerful archetypes, including the old-time sheriff, Vail Ennis. Um, the book ends. Uh, with, with uh, Camp Azell, who was the editor of the paper, the Beeville Picayune, uh, uh, and Vail Ennis in a conversation. Um, High noon ends as a disgusted marshal. Will Kane throws his badge in the dirt. Vail didn't do that. He took defeat as he thought a Texan should. He took it like Alfred Alley and the Rangers did in 1933 when Ma Ferguson dismissed the whole Corps. But his feelings were hurt. After the election, Vail went to see Camp Azell at the B. Picayune office and sat in the chair beside his desk. Camp, he said, you were my enemy. No, Vail, said Camp, I was your friend. Vail looked at him closely. He knew it was true. Vail, said Camp, I voted against you in every election you ever ran in. You should not have been in that office. The violence, the violence. And that's how the book ends. So these are three great examples of regional, local history uh, with national flavor, uh, with, uh, with uh, local uh, points of interest and eccentricities that make them really fun reading. And I think the, the local, regional, non-fiction, uh, true story kind of narrative can be really great fun, even if you don't know anything about the region. Uh, it's, it's always fun. So, uh, these, these have all come out in the last few years, two of them this year. And so be on the lookout for this kind of local, regional nonfiction. And you might want to try one of these books. They're all three wonderful reads. So see you next time.